Welcome to the West Bank. We're gonna be meeting some people who are referred to as the West Bank settlers. It's a very, very complicated area. Uh, Israeli settlements. 75, 80 percent of the people here probably don't know English. A generation now, they grew up in a time when there was like real violence. We've been living in the context of this conflict. We're acknowledging that this mountain has some unique significance. This whole area used to be a forest. This is a guard tower from the second temple period, the headquarters of the Maccabee underground. Oh man, this is cool. When I moved to this mountain, it was actually naked. I want Jews to be able to live in the West Bank. We were colonized, like layers and layers and layers of colonization. We should be living here as a native people on its land. I'd say the closest thing to what we are is a civilization. Being American, it's like you come with such a wrong mentality about this place. The truth is there are parts of Judea that are not in the West Bank, there are parts of Samaria that are not in the West Bank, and there are parts of the West Bank that are not in Judea or Samaria. It's the most important part of this video is like the relationship between us and the Palestinians. Good morning, my friends. Salamu alaikum. Bukhim abayim. Welcome to the West Bank, Judea, Samaria, or the Palestinian territories, depending on who you are and what you want to call it. I, quite frankly, don't really care. We are right now in a place called Beit El. This is crazy. I've actually never been to this area before in Israel or Palestine, whatever you want to call it. And it's early morning today. We're going to be doing something a little peculiar. We're going to be meeting some people who are referred to as the West Bank settlers or Jewish settlers within the West Bank. That's what we're here for because this is a Jewish settlement. I wanted to show you guys a little look into what life is actually like here. Because I personally don't know everything that goes on here. And I wanted to learn myself. So we've come to Bet El to meet some cool people to, uh, to introduce us to this lifestyle. Oh man, I just noticed down here. You know, the West Bank is sort of like Israel's, this region's like uh, Wild West. It's a very, very complicated area with lots of Palestinian enclaves and Israeli cities, uh, Israeli settlements like based within it. And it really is like a wild west, you know, it's like it's very um, underdeveloped still. But this is Israeli territory with army support, um, Israeli buses reach here, but the drivers of the buses are Palestinian. It's, it's super, super interesting. Oh, here we have Bible quotes, Bereshit, Genesis. Um, I think this has something to do with Jacob's dream. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because I don't know this place yet. And I'd like to explore it in depth with the people who actually know it today. But yeah, we're deep in it, folks. Welcome to the West Bank. All right, my friend, so this is Yehuda Cohen. We're gonna be following him around today. He's a, a local resident of the area. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and where we're about to go into right now? Yeah, my name's Yuda. I live on a mountain just next to this town. We're in uh, Betel, and uh, we're here for Shachrit. We're here to uh, for the Tfilot of the morning. Uh, you know, it's also Elul, head of Rosh Hashanah. And you right. see that we'll hear the Shofar, Bezot Hashem. And because uh, it's Monday, we'll also get uh, Kriyat Torah. We're actually in the period of, of the high holidays of Judaism right now, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur which is the, the Jewish New Year and the Day of Atonement, like literally the most important holiday in Judaism. So we're heading into a synagogue right now to do uh, Shacharit, which is the early morning prayer. I'm not the most religious Jew, so it's not something I do every single day, but I'll show you guys what this looks like. Nope. Hello, 
باش کداش All right, we just uh, wrapped up Shacharit. Yehuda, is this something you do every single morning? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. It's, uh, it's like your morning ritual. Uh, my morning routine. It's uh, most people's morning routine here. Yeah? Is this place, is Betel considered a very religious place? I'd say that most people who live here don't think in terms of those um, uh, social constructs. Mm -hmm. like, I don't think anybody here or probably very few people here, maybe some who come from, uh, there's like a handful of people here who come from uh, more uh, like English speaking countries, but most people here actually don't speak English. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, well, I'd say probably like 75, 80% of the people here probably don't know English. Oh, wow. Um, so the people who come from like English speaking countries might have that idea of like a religion called Judaism in their heads. But most people who live here don't have that. It's like for them, it's just their folkways. We're back in Yehuda's house now. Something interesting is about to happen. I wanted to ask you what what are we what are we about to do right now? A uh, group is coming. They were just in Ramallah. Um, they're coming to us. They want to hear the perspective of a Jew living in the West Bank. Um, then they're going to head over to Bethlehem, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. They're right now driving through Bethel. They're going to come up to the mountain. And we'll uh, talk to them. I guess we'll give them the perspective of a Jew living in the West Bank. Is it something you do frequently? Is having like groups of tourists come here and talk to you? Uh, yeah, it happens quite a bit. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, it depends who. There are, I think there are a lot of Palestinian tour guides who like their groups to hear my perspective. Mm -hmm. And the, the tour guide of this group is Palestinian? Yeah. So how did he even get in contact with you? Like We met, uh, I don't know, what, he and I met, I guess, a couple of years ago, maybe. Uh -huh. maybe? Um, he's, you know, he's been doing this a long time and uh, he felt that uh, my perspective is a good one to share with his people. Hey man, hey. I'm having a guest and camera, what's up? If it's okay, uh, you ask the group. How are you? Okay, hey. nice, nice to meet you guys. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. He doesn't you know? shake hands with women. Yeah. Okay. Justly, so sorry I didn't mention that. You know, when you have a whole uh, generation now, I would say people who are now uh, in their 20s and 30s, uh, living in communities like this, they grew up in a time where there was like real violence and drive-by shootings and buses blowing up and and neighbors being killed and teachers being killed and, and relatives being killed. It's like real. It's not like a, it's not like somebody who has like a political opinion living in Texas. And I don't think it's just the Jews living in the West Bank. The truth is, I think all of Israeli society has this issue where where we've been living in the context of this conflict um, where and it's very hard. It's very hard. Like I, I experience it just in the course of my work. Um, and it's not just Israelis. To be fair, it's Palestinians too. Um, it's very hard to overcome what I would call like a principled resistance to even understanding the identity and narrative of the other. And I think that's part of the problem. We're not fighting each other. We're fighting our fantasies of each other. I'm also very careful when I give uh, dual narrative tours of Hebron. I often tell the group, you know, let, you know, they have a Jewish guide, which is me, uh, in some cases, you know, when I'm speaking to them, it's me, and they have a Palestinian guide. And I try to tell them in advance that the, the goal here is to really hear the Jewish story from the Jewish guide and hear the Palestinian story from the Palestinian guide. And the exercise that I think is helpful for participants on these type of programs is to really try to put these stories together um, and see if they can create a 
a bigger story that's inclusive enough to encompass both ostensibly rival stories. And that's really, I think, uh, for me, you know, I'm involved in a lot of different kinds of work. One of the projects I'm focused on is applying uh, post-colonial theory to Jewish issues. Anyone really outside the Jewish people or like, or even Jews who are like living outside their own people's story, it's a hard story to tell. Because most people are used to, oh, are you a colonizer or are you indigenous or like, well, what do you do with the people that existed thousands of years ago? was destroyed and displaced, it actually managed to survive, like maintain its identity in kind of like portable form for many, many centuries. And then eventually like succeeded coming back using tools of colonialism. The Zionist movement as like an indigenous people's liberation movement, are we looking at it as a colonial project that came out of Europe? And the truth is we're complicated. And, uh, and there's no other example of like an ancient people that was destroyed and came back to life 2,000 years later and went back to its land and took possession of it like through war. Like, you know, we fought the British for 10 years. You can't achieve peace by forcing either side to compromise on something that's fundamentally important to us. The only way to achieve peace is to make both peoples fully experience themselves as winners. And it's therefore helpful, that's where I said I apply some of the um, some of the worldview and logic of our ancestors to actually say, well, what's like a unique, like authentically Hebrew approach to dealing with this? You know, I believe there's an objective capital T truth in the world, but I don't believe any of us are wired to grasp it. Like, I don't think any of us are capable of really understanding that. I think we all have our subjective truths and our lives are journeys of trying to come close to this objective truth, and the best way to do that is to be inclusive of other people's subjective truths. And so, uh, could you? I mean, sorry to yeah. be, but could you? Is there any kind you of you want concrete? Yeah, I yeah. want something concrete. <laughs> sure. even, if it's, even if it's, you know, like no. you have these two cups, and yeah, I sure. want one cup, and no. I want the cup you want, and you want the cup I want, okay. but we each have our cups, and we're not willing to share. Right. You know. So I think that it? in look again. I, I can only speak of my experiences with Palestinians. And the, the Jewish character of our state is very hard, but very shallow. If we can make it deep and soft instead of hard and shallow, then those Jews who are looking for a deeply Jewish state would see it. They would just like happen to see it in all the policies and institutions of the country. And anyone who doesn't have that, who doesn't have that Jewish education, doesn't know what to look for, will just experience a democratic society where everybody has full equality. That was uh, that was interesting. Yeah, how so? I, I, I don't know. I felt like, uh, it, well, the group was comprised most, it was all Americans. Yeah. And uh, the way that you speak to them, uh -huh. The way that you're able to get intimate with them and really convey your ideas, man, I gotta say, it's something that as a Jew, mm -hmm. I it's super inspiring. Like I listen to okay. you talk, and I'm like, I feel like I need to do more of the, like a better job at explaining who I am. Ah. You know, it's. Uh, you think I did okay telling the story of our people? I I think it's like okay is doing it a disservice. It's okay. like I think you actually taught these people something, uh -huh. and also I like again being American. It's like you come with such a wrong mentality about this place. Mm -hmm. You really do. You come on the ground, and even some of the things that they said to you was like, right. yeah, I was like these questions are rooted it's in okay. right in, in applying the wrong framework to our country and our social situation, etc. And it, it might be the Mizrahi Jew in me that just gets fired up immediately. It's like, I, I want to get up and say, who, who do you think you are? Right, right. But the way that you explain those ideas, right. it's, yeah, it's beautiful. I've done this a couple of times. But yeah, I think it's important. You know, one of them, uh, one of the women uh, who I guess worked as a psychotherapist and social worker, counselor, she said that, um, that it's important, I guess, in negotiations or I guess she's dealt with a lot of divorce couples. She said to me as she was, as we were walking out, she always tells people you need to do three things, you know, when entering into negotiations. She said, uh, number one, know yourself well, right? Like know who you are, know your identity well. Number two, communicate clearly, right? So the other person, I guess, can know where you're coming from. And the third is compromise carefully. And I think she's right. I think that, that that's like actually a good, I'm glad I remembered it. Uh, that's, a, that's a good framework, right? Like you need to know yourself well. That's why it's so important that the, um, that those like driving reconciliation efforts on the Israeli side should be the Jews most deeply rooted in our identity and our land and our national story, etc. cetera. Um, it doesn't help for some like westernized Israeli from Tel Aviv to talk to Palestinians about like, you know, what Ben-Gurion said, because that's not our like deep, 
story. It right. might be a, a piece of our story, but it's not our real like story that we need to be living. So we need to know who we are. We need to comp- we, we need to communicate clearly, and then we need to compromise carefully. Meaning, know what we can and can't compromise on, right? And I think there's a, a lot of room for compromise, but uh, but certain things are are obviously you know like like very firm lines in the sand. Okay, my friend. So this is Sharona, Yuda's wife, and well, I'm just gonna let you explain what <laughs> what you do, especially when it comes to dietary requirements here. Sure. Okay. So um, we keep kosher, mm-hmm. obviously, um, and kashrut. There's a lot of different rules when it comes to to keeping kosher um, that don't just have to do with separating meat and dairy. In our house, we we actually don't eat meat or dairy. Um, we're what's we're what's called parav, um, which is all food that's not meat or dairy, but it also includes fish and eggs. So we eat egg whites and, and some certain kinds of fish It's for, uh, for health reasons. Uh, so today I'm gonna make for you. Um, this is, I don't eat gluten and my daughters also don't eat gluten. So this is fermented buckwheat bread. Is that out of choice by the way? Gluten free, like out of choice or is it because um, it's of a- for health. Okay, Yeah. cool. So th- it has just three ingredients. Um, Buckwheat, water, and salt. That's awesome. Um, I've never had buckwheat bread. Not that I can think of. I had a lot of buckwheat, like, oats when I was in Russia, but I never had buckwheat bread before. Right. So it's actually a really cool faux grain. Mm-hmm. Not real. Um, but it, it can act like a bread. Hopefully this one came out tasty. <laughs> Yeah, it kind of looks like a sourdough on the inside. Well, yeah, fermented is it is sourdough. You'll taste it. It has like some tang. And since we don't eat dairy, I also make all my own almond milk, and from it, I make almond all sorts of almond cheeses, Parmesan cheese. So this is almond cream cheese. This is almond cream cheese. That is so exciting. Yeah. Where where do you get like all the ingredients for everything from? You just go to like a normal um, supermarket, or is it like? Do you make a... The, the buckwheat I buy... There are a lot of... There's actually a really big growing um, community here of... I think Israel has the highest per capita number of vegans in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of health food stores. There's been like a health food store explosion in the last, let's say, like 10 years. So I buy I buy a organic buckwheat. The almonds are just from a regular store, but I soak them for eight hours. Um before I blend them. And even here, like in the West Bank and Judea Samaria, you can find like health food stores, health food stores easily. Yeah. yeah. I go, I also like to go to the Shuk um, in Jerusalem. Okay. Um, but there are health food stores. There are two health food stores about 15 minutes away. Oh, amazing. And there's a small one in Beitel itself. That's sweet. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I'm going to give this a shot. Okay. I'm just going to eat this here standing. So buckwheat and almond cream cheese sandwich. That's exciting. <laughs> Mm. Wow, it's insane that you can make almonds taste like that. Tastes like cream cheese. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, the bread, you know what's funny? The bread is like, I ate Ethiopian food yesterday. It's just kind of like in between an injera and a sourdough bread. Everyone says it tastes like injera. It tastes almost yeah. exactly like injera. And it almost has the same color as well. And the consistency too, like kind of The consistency, it's like a little spongy. Yeah. Mm, it's really good. And it's nice too that it forms a crust on the outside. That's really cool. Man, this uh this part of the world like literally never gets old to me. It's just like if you I seriously when I think of the Bible, I think of stories of the Bible, it's like just this looks so legit. And that's kind of the part of the reason why we're here, is to tell you guys a little bit about this area. So uh when I moved to this mountain it was actually naked. There was no fences, there were no signs, no benches, no structures really except for the ones that look fairly old, right? Um in recent years there are people who put fences and benches and signs up. I think trying to make this more of a tourist attraction. We'll try to walk through and see what's here without relying on those signs. Okay, sounds good. I like that. This looks like a tomb. Yeah, it's all... Um, it's called Kever Sheikh. Kever Sheikh? Kever Sheikh. The name. burial place of Sheikh? The burial place of the Sheikh. 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 Yeah. Basically, the Crusaders, when they ruled this land, they built this capella, like a chapel mm-hmm. there. And then later, the Mamluks 
uh, when they ruled this land, they built a mosque here on top of the chapel. Both were acknowledging that this mountain has some unique significance, right? That there's something important about this mountain. Also, the Ottoman Empire, by the way, when they um, built their railroad from uh, Syria to Egypt, they chopped down trees, both to make room for the tracks and also to have wood for the tracks. And their practice was to leave a tree standing in a place considered holy, like a holy site. So this is actually one of the oldest trees in Israel. It's an oak tree. It's one of the oldest trees in the country. The Ottomans left it here. That, that sign actually was here when I first came, um, right? But uh, that wood sign. But the, this whole like structure holding up the tree, the fence around it, that's all new. So we have the Crusaders, the Mamluks, and the Ottomans all recognizing this as a holy place. This was an ancient mosque at one point. The Mamluks built it as a mosque. Wow. This whole area used to be a forest, mm -hmm. but the, um, the Ottomans chopped down most of the trees when they built the railroad, but that one they left here. This is most likely an ancient mikvah, which means that the ancient Israelites also considered this to be a holy place. A long time ago, during the first temple period, after the reign of Shlomo, uh, Solomon in English, the kingdom split into two. There was the kingdom of Yehuda and the kingdom of Israel. Okay, Now, uh, within Israeli society, there are different tribal forces. I think this is a, actually a much better way to understand Israeli society today and the broader Jewish world than kind of imposing these like Western framings, like liberal, conservative, right, left, secular, religious. Like those are very Western social framings or political framings that have a lot to do with the development of Western civilization and the experiences of Western civilization, very little to do with us. And when you try to apply those framings to Israeli society, you end up, you, you end up getting things wrong. And there are obviously groups in the society that don't fit in to like, for example, like a linear Western political spectrum. You look at all the parties in our Knesset, some will fit neatly and some won't because that's not exactly uh, a good method of understanding Israeli society. So a better way, I think, is the tribal identities, right? There's all these different tribal identities that used to be biological, right, in the time of uh, Yaakov's sons, you know, the tribes of Israel. Today, I think it's more uh, different ty personality types within the Jewish people, different inclinations. So we can say that the two leadership tribes are Yehuda and Yosef. Yehuda, Judah, uh, is more focused on what's unique about the children of Israel. Our unique identity, our unique history, our unique destiny, our mission in history, our Torah, our temple, Jerusalem. What makes us unique? What makes us distinct? What makes us different from the other nations of the world? That's Yehuda's focus. Yosef is like also a leadership tribe, but is very much the opposite. Yosef is focused mostly on the material well-being of our people. Things like uh, our economy, our security, defense, right? Yosef is very focused on what we share in common with the rest of the world, with the other peoples of the world, especially the most dominant civilization of any given period. So in Yosef ben Yaakov's time, it was Egypt, right? Yosef was very into Egyptian culture and eventually ended up in Egypt and became a ruler in Egypt. And even his brothers thought he was an Egyptian when they first met him. They couldn't even tell that it was their brother Yosef. He looked, he resembled an Egyptian. So Yosef is like the part of our identity that kind of like looks like the dominant civilization of any given period. Today it's obviously Western civilization. And therefore when it comes to Yosef and Yehuda, um, because Yehuda for the most part is very much looking at the world through the lens of Jewish identity and Jewish history. Um, he, you know, if you put a social or political issue in front of him, he might come to conclusions based on lessons of our people's past, our values, halakha, etc. Yosef can look at those same social or political issues and go according to what's politically correct right now in the most like civilized, enlightened, quote unquote, part of the world. So th these are very different types of identities, types of leadership roles. And Yosef is very much, even though he's more connected to the rest of the world, 
he is more easily influenced. So to make it practical, when the kingdom split after the death of Shlomo, the kingdom of Israel was for the most part ruled by somebody from the tribe of Ephraim, which was one of the sub-tribes of Yosef. So Yosef, for the most part, the most important kings of the tribe of the kingdom of Israel were from Yosef. Whereas the kings of the tribe of the, the kingdom of Yehuda were from the tribe of Yehuda, were from the family of David, right? So the kingdom of Israel was bigger, stronger, economically stronger, militarily stronger, diplomatically, was more connected to the rest of the world, was more relevant, like to current events at the time, but was also more susceptible to the influences of other nations, was also more easily influenced by the cultures and ideologies of the outside world. Whereas the kingdom of Yehuda, the kingdom of Judah, was for the most part a landlocked desert kingdom, you know, in Jerusalem with the Torah, with the temple. And it wasn't just Yehuda, by the way. It was also Shimon and Levi, who are like the extreme expressions of, of Yehuda, in the same way that the tribe of Dan is an extreme expression of the tribe of Yosef. And also Binyamin stayed with Yehuda, which is very important because Binyamin represents the future. Binyamin represents the next generation. The fact that Binyamin stayed with Yehuda and Shimon and Levi um, shows or allowed or led to our people's history continuing with that kingdom. That's why we're called Jews today. We're called Jews today because we are for the most part the descendants of the tribes that stayed with Yehuda under Yehuda's leadership. That Ju Judah's leadership. Mm -hmm. So we're called Jews today. I'm from the tribe of Levi. I'm a Kohen from the tribe of Levi, but I'm called the Jew often because my ancestors were part of that Judean kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, the kingdom of Yehuda. Um, now, the king of Israel at the time, Yeravam ben Nevat, uh, from the tribe of Ephraim, which is one of the sub tribes of Yosef, he had a problem. Even though he was the stronger king, more relevant on the international scene, uh, just more powerful by any real measurement at the time, three times a year, his legitimacy would be challenged. Because on Pesach, on Shavuot, and on Sukkot, we go to the Temple Mount, to, you know, on what's called Ali al Regel, pilgrimage to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And on the Temple Mount, there's only one human who's allowed to sit down, and that's the King of Israel. But it's not Yeravam ben Navat, the King of Malchut Israel, the King of Israel, it's his rival, Rechavam ben Shlomo, the son of Solomon, from the Davidic line, uh, from the tribe of Judah, who happens to be the king in, in Yehuda, in Jerusalem. So even though he's the more powerful king, he would be shown to be less legitimate three times a year, and therefore he decided, you know what, no more going to Jerusalem. He made it illegal for his subjects to go to Jerusalem, he put guards on the border, between his kingdom and the kingdom of Yehuda, and he said, I'm going to make you an alternative site to serve the Creator. And that's what this mikvah is doing here. Because right over here, people would dunk in the mikvah and they would bring their uh, korbanot to the priests here, and then they would. Right here, this is where the korbanot? They would bring the for preparation, mm -hmm. most likely. Those are sacrifices, by the way. All these English translations often get the meaning of these words wrong, but yeah. Here, um, these are the ruins of Yeravam's temple. He built here a temple with a golden calf as an alternative to the temple in Jerusalem. And he said, you want to serve the Kedosh Baruch Hu, you want to serve the Creator, don't go to Jerusalem. It's illegal not to go to Jerusalem. Instead, come here to this golden calf. He built another one in the far north of his kingdom in Dan. He said, Here's the golden calf. This is where you come. And the and throughout the rest of the first temple period, for the most part, um, the people who were part of the kingdom of Israel that saw themselves as loyal to Hashem in the Torah would come to this golden calf on this mountain and bring their korbanot uh, instead of Jerusalem. Not the prophets, obviously. They were mm -hmm. against. But you had a situation where the kingdom of Israel was very influenced by the different idolatrous practices of our neighbors that um, this became, even though this is very problematic too, this became like the quote-unquote legitimate uh, way to worship Hashem, to serve Hashem. And, uh, and all those other things were obviously idolatry. They, but most people didn't realize, like the average like farmer or tanner or whatever, didn't realize that this is kind of idolatry too. 
what's interesting about the golden calf in general is that it's um, it's a form of idolatry that actually comes out of our identity as opposed to like things we picked up from the Phoenicians or the Canaanites or the Moabites or Egyptians or anybody else this form of idolatry was actually comes from within our own identity which makes it more dangerous mm -hmm. um, so the question though is why would your Avam do this why would he build a golden calf on this mountain yeah like what's significant about this mountain why here right that's the question because if you go deeper into his territory if you go past Harbal Khatsor, that huge kind of twin mountain over there mm -hmm. that's called Harbal Khatsor. that's the border between Judea and Samaria we're still in we're in northern Judea right now other side is what's called the Samaria region on that mountain, by the way, is where Avraham, our ancestor, did what's called the Brit Benabitarim, the covenant between the parts. Um, and now, actually, inside, it's an Air Force base, hmm. uh, responsible for our eastern front, if I'm not mistaken. So, just over Harbal Chatzor is a Jewish town called Shiloh. And for 369 years, Shiloh had been our people's spiritual capital, before Jerusalem. And at this point, when Yeravam becomes king, Jerusalem was really only our spiritual capital for roughly 40 years mm -hmm. so instead of building a golden calf on this mountain why not rebuild the tabernacle the mishkan deeper into his territory in the town of shiloh this is a place that everybody knew had been our spiritual center for 369 years he could have told the people of israel you guys know your grandparents knew this is where they would bring their korbanot this is where they would serve the creator not jerusalem jerusalem was a creation of the davidic family right it was a very easy argument to make if I was advising him, I would have told him, do that. Rebuild the Mishkan in Shiloh. More legitimacy, more credibility. Come on. But he did this instead. He built his temple, this golden calf, right here on this mountain. And I think the reason he did that is because we already considered this to be a holy place at that time. Okay? If you walk this way, we're going to take a look at what his temple is facing. A few years ago... We brought a geologist here who confirmed that this rock is what we call a conglomerate, meaning that this was once upon a time several rocks that at a certain point in history became one rock. Okay? Uh, the story goes that our ancestor Yaakov had to flee from his brother Esav, and he went to a place called Luz. Okay? And Luz today is just right around this mountain, it's called Bitin. Okay, so he goes to Luz, but he doesn't sleep in the inn at Luz because his brother would have found him there. Instead, what Yaakov does is he walks up to this mountain, roughly a kilometer outside of Luz, and he goes to sleep on 12 stones. He has a dream, that's a pretty famous dream, that there's a ladder with malachim, uh, spiritual forces, often translated into angels in English, I don't know what that means, but malachim, like these like, spiritual forces, climbing up and down, ascending and descending the ladder. That's his dream. In the morning he wakes up and the 12 stones underneath him have become one stone. And we believe that to be this stone. When he wakes up and realizes that he's in a place of Kedusha, right? He's in a place of holiness. He renames Luz Betel. And this mm. becomes known as Betel. Decades later, when Yaakov returns home from exile, uh, he, after his, two of his sons, Shimon and Levi, conquer the city of Shechem. Uh, he and his family are brought back to this mountain and he's renamed Israel. Like that happens also on this mountain. Yaakov is renamed Israel. Yeah, this is a guard tower. This is a guard tower from the second temple period. Now, after one of the Judean kings destroyed the golden calf on this mountain, we didn't like calling this Betel. In the second temple period, we called this Gofana. Um, like Geffen, because the, some of the best wine in the country comes from this area, right? Gofna. The story basically goes that when the Seleucid Greek Empire ruled our land and they started to outlaw our culture and they started to impose their culture and their ideas and their practices on us, there was a group uh, really led by a family from Odin of Kohanim, Matetiao and his sons, that revolted against Greek rule. Now, the, the revolt started in Modin, but they couldn't stay in Modin. They came up here to Gofna, and this became the partisan camp of the Maccabee underground for the first roughly five years of the revolt, right? It was a 26-year war, 
Um, but for the first few years before we conquered Jerusalem, this was the headquarters of the Maccabee underground. Matityahu, who started the revolt, he died on this mountain. Uh, he put his uh, second son, Shimon, in charge of the family, and his third son, Yehuda, in charge of the war. Uh, Yehuda becomes known as Yehuda Maccabee, Yehuda the Maccabee, Judah the Maccabee. Um, he actually ends up being killed down in that valley in the Battle of the Chiris. He faced um, 20,000 mercenaries and 2,000 cavalry with only 800 fighters. Yehuda actually invented what we call guerrilla war. Uh, using the land, using the terrain as a weapon against a more powerful enemy. Uh, he would lure the Greek mercenaries into narrow passes where their cavalry wouldn't be able to help them too much, where their phalanxes wouldn't really work, uh, where they couldn't fight according to their training, and where their superior weapons and armor would also be worth a lot less. We'd fill the skies with arrows, what the Greeks would call Judean rain, and those arrows would pour down on them and uh, whoever that didn't kill, we'd charge down the mountains and pick off. And that was basically uh, how we, after 26 years, how we won our, our freedom. Um, but this was the place where it really began. This was like the partisan camp of the Maccabeem. This is um, their main guard tower. Uh, for me, it's actually very, a very powerful experience to live here because I really uh, experienced myself as a character in a later chapter of the same story that they were characters in. And as much as somebody wants to dispute whether or not there was Yaakov, whether or not he had a dream on this mountain, it's not a dispute that this was the partisan camp of the Maccabim. Meaning that is easy to prove. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of the biblical stories, I believe it's true. I, b I believe for sure that Yaakov had his dream on this mountain, but I can't prove it to you scientifically. But it's beyond question that the Maccabeem had their partisan camp here. This mountain is full of caves, going back a long time. This is where a lot of the fighters would sleep. But it's really up here that Yudah Maccabee had the task of transforming a group of teachers and tanners and farmers into guerrilla fighters. It's in one of the larger caves, but it's flooded. It's interesting that it's flooded. Why, why is there so yeah. much water in here? It's summer. Oh, it's no, summertime, no. too. No, no, the water, for some reason, that water stays. That's interesting. Wow, look at that. Oh, man, this is cool. Whoa. So this cave uh, was actually the, the nerve center of the Maccabean Revolt. This is where most of the officers' meetings probably took place, where a lot of the uh, shiurim took place, where people learned Torah, where people uh, engaged in tefillah, uh, where people made their olive oil. You have a bunch of olive presses here, different kinds of yeah, olive presses wow. here. Look at that, that's definitely an olive press. Mm -hmm. Most of the ideas driving the revolt were formulated here. There was a very deep machloket. There was a very strong difference of opinion between the Maccabim, like the family of Matityahu, the Hashmonaim, and the Hasidim. The Hasidim uh, were the majority of his soldiers. Like the majority of fighters were from a group called the Hasidim. The Hasidim were fighting for our folkways, for our culture, for our identity, fighting so we could have Shabbat, so we can have Brit Milah, so we can have uh, uh, our calendar, all which were outlawed by the Greeks, right? The Greeks outlawed our calendar, they outlawed Shabbat. They outlawed circumcision, Brit Milah. They outlawed the study of Torah. They would take our brides on the wedding night and let her go, it's called prima nocta, right? Like let her go with the Greek governor or Greek general before she could be with her husband. So that's what the Hasidim were fighting for. And that might have been what the Maccabim were fighting for at first. But very quickly the Maccabim realized we're not just fighting for our culture and our identity, we're fighting for political possession of our land. We're fighting to keep our homeland free from foreign rule. Because that's also uh, like a value in our society. That's also a commandment in our Torah, right? That we should possess the land. And uh, over that, the Maccabees were willing to fight 26 years until they eventually won under the leadership of Shimon, the last surviving son of Matityahu. Uh, whereas the Hasidim withdrew as soon as the Greeks offered them cultural autonomy in exchange for stopping the revolt, in exchange for accepting imperial rule. 
And it was for that reason that Yehuda found himself alone with only 800 fighters facing off against 22,000 because the Hasidim had already withdrew from the revolt and were back with their families and farms, etc., leaving the more, I guess what we can call, extreme Maccabee faction to fight on its own. Listen, this is one of the most cool-looking caves I've ever been in my life. The roof is, this is what's <laughs> was screwing with me. This looks like it was a small cave and then somebody came here and carved it out. You just took me around on a mountain that you live really close by to, or no, pretty I, much this, on, I yeah. Live on this mountain. And you showed me a bunch of sites that pertain to our people's history. Yeah. Like, that's like some solid proof, evidence that tracing back our people existed here. Lived yeah, here. Yeah, not that I think anyone could really deny it. Well, that's what I'm curious about, you know, like, okay, within the context of this video, mm -hmm. you know, in the title of this video, most mm -hmm. people probably clicked on it because they saw the word settler, oh. right? And that's what a lot of people will have an image of you as, a colonial settler, somebody who's coming in from the outside right, right. to claim land that's not theirs. Uh -huh. So, I'm curious, like, when you live so close to stuff like this, or, or on a place like this, mm -hmm. like... How does that make you feel? Uh, well, f first of all, before I get into how it makes me feel, I think that, um, you know, uh, from a material perspective, from a structural perspective, I don't want to be a settler, mm -hmm. right? I want to be able to live here. I want Jews to be able to live in the West Bank, which also happens to be the cradle of our civilization, without being settlers, without living according to the structures of settler colonialism and without... Um, disenfranchising anybody. Right, these are the hills of Gofna mm -hmm. because the best wine in the country comes like Geffen, right? Like go, oh, is that where the word comes from? Gofna, right? The best wines in the country come from here. Mm -hmm. yeah, Geffen is, is vine, actually. Yeah. Also, when you don't sift the wine, you get all the nature of, uh, of the wine itself. Mm -hmm. it, you don't need to clear it. Look at the color of it. It's very pretty as is. I'm not looking for something that is diluted. You say diluted? Is that the word? Diluted, yeah. Diluted? Yeah. I want something thick. I want to fill it. I want to know that I'm eating a fruit here. By Jews, there's a special bracha, a special blessing for wine. Right. Right? Because wine is something special. It's not like every fruit. It behaves different. And if you leave it open uh, uh, long enough, you get different aromas coming out, different flavors coming out. It's changing all the time. And you can keep it very long and so on. Something that is uh, full of mystery. I want to show you in their winery here, uh, just in the backyard. I feel like I may be a little drunk already. <laughs> I'm drinking some wine right now. Um, they have uh, this beautiful fig tree, massive fig trees. We've talked about this on the channel multiple times in extensiveness. Figs are one of my favorite fruits in the world. And they have a massive fig tree back here with uh, just, and just the smell of this tree alone can drive someone crazy. Look at that fig. Pick a nice big one. The owner just gave me an invitation. I didn't just uh, pick it for no reason. I'll show you on the inside. Usually when you're picking these wild figs, you do want to give a little check for worms just in case. You pop it open like this. See if anything's moving around in there. You can just eat the inside. Mm. Wow. Oh my God, it's amazing. Look how beautiful that is on the inside. And this is the first fig I've ever had that like the skin peels off easy. It's really like interesting. So you just brought me over now to a, a bakery called Herbie's Bake Shop. It's a killer donut. <laughs> oh man. But who, who would have expected and how here to have amazing donuts? Seriously, that's amazing. Really, really good. Mm. Better than a Krispy Kreme, I swear. That's a really fresh. Coming out here to the sort of border of the community of uh, Bethel. It's amazing seeing this place. It's just so, so, so beautiful. Such a fascinating place with so many moving parts. So many different elements. And so much, honestly, so much to learn here. Uh, I think the one, the biggest thing that I've been learning throughout this whole adventure of being in the West Bank more often now is, uh, is how complicated it really is. And trying to paint it with one single brush 
does it a big disservice, you know. Um, nothing productive comes of that. Trying to actually get to know this place, get to know the people that live in here, learn their struggles on both sides is the most important, most important thing you could do. It's the most important part of this video is like the relationship between us and the Palestinians, right? Mm -hmm. It's trying to understand our identity in this conflict, what we believe. And earlier in the video, I was saying things about Judaism, mm -hmm. about ethnicity, about religion. These are things that you don't subscribe to and you don't think... Well, well I think we, I think the people of Israel predate all of those social constructs, mm -hmm. like religion, race, ethnicity, nationality, culture. We exist before all that. I'd say the closest thing to what we are is a civilization, kind of like the Aztecs, right? We have a spiritual component to our identity. We have a legal component to our identity. We have a national component to our identity. We have a territorial component to our identity. We have a spiritual component to our identity. But we're not just limited to any of those things. And I think uh, part of what happened to us in exile is uh, we were colonized, like layers and layers and layers of colonization. Uh, if if you're interested, you asked earlier how Jews living in the West Bank see ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And I use the term West Bank intentionally, by the way. I know there are a lot of Jews who live out here who would say Judea or Judea and Samaria. Um, the truth is there are parts of Judea that are not in the West Bank. There are parts of Samaria that are not in the West Bank. And there are parts of the West Bank that are not Judea or Samaria, like the Jordan Valley. So I think it's like technically problematic to just use Judea and Samaria as like a synonym for the West Bank. When I say the West Bank, I mean the piece of territory that we took back from Jordan in the Six-Day War. They took it from us in 1948, we took it back in 1967, and it's really one of the most integral parts of our homeland. And I'd say that the Jews living in the West Bank, even though we're not ideologically homogenous there are many different types of Jews who live in different parts of the West Bank I think the ideological common denominator is that we see ourselves as a proud ancient people from this land that was forcibly displaced by the Roman Empire against our will somehow managed to maintain our identity in exile for roughly 2,000 years before against all odds coming back to the land we had been displaced from and uh, taking it from the British in a almost decade-long armed struggle, right? For roughly nine years, we were engaged in, a urban in an urban guerrilla war against British rule here. Uh, they left in 1948, citing Jewish terrorism as the reason uh, for their withdrawal. Uh, we revived our ancient language. We uh, came back in 1967 to the most important parts of our land. I think we experience all international efforts at a two-state solution as the world trying to displace us again after we worked so hard and fought so hard to come back to this land. Uh, so we're determined to resist any partition of our land. Um, the best method of struggle we figured out to resist the international community so far is to build as many Jewish communities as we can in different parts of the West Bank. I'd say some of these communities do function as settlements, meaning they are structured according to a settler colonial model, and some of these communities don't. And I think it's important to differentiate. I think it's important we learn to live here not as settlers. Like Jews should be living in the West Bank, but not according to the structures of settler colonialism. We should be living here as a native people on its land. Um, and also at peace with the other native peoples of this land. That's the, obviously the most important point that I want to hark on is like, how do you see your relationship with Palestinians? Well, like, I personally have a good relationship with a lot of Palestinians. Uh, not everybody here does. Uh -huh. um, but it's also partially because I view reconciliation between us and the Palestinians, specifically us, meaning like the Jews who live in the West Bank, the Jews who are deeply rooted in our identity, the Jews who are really living the national aspirations of our people, the national story of our people, uh, who are like deeply rooted here. I think those Jews, Jews like me, need to be at the forefront of reconciliation efforts with the Palestinians. Uh, and I do see such reconciliation as an objective of Jewish liberation. I do believe that at this stage of history, Jewish liberation and Palestinian liberation are very much intertwined. And you can't really have liberation for one without the other. They, they come hand in hand. They have to, because part of what we need, part of our decolonization at this point, right, is uh, psychological. 
uh, for them, decolonization is very material, mm -hmm. meaning that uh, part of you know dismantling the colonial features of Zionism uh, require us to also re-indigenize into the land in our own heads, like like part of us freeing ourselves from what you can call uh, our colonization or an exile mentality or whatever terminology you want to use, but really healing ourselves from roughly 2,000 years of like traumatic persecution, uh, that's not easy. And I think right. the, the more uh, successfully we engage in that project of, of Jewish decolonization, uh, the more we'll shift how we relate to Palestinians and uh, and also our own fears and our own need for like control security etc and be able to live here like as a normal people with other peoples here and like to put it into actual like you know like I think where my problem seats with the whole s situation especially with how it's treated online is people's um, feeling that like they all need to speak up especially people who are completely outside of the conflict and and for me like when I when I'm here with you and I'm standing with you right now like right behind us, I don't. What's the name here? Uh, Jifna. Jifna. Like I, you can see the minarets, you can see the mosques yeah, over there. Also, well, also there's um, Jalazun. There's Jalazun. There's Jifna. There's a lot of different Palestinian communities around here. But yeah, okay, you see minarets going. You know, it's like this is your living. Where we're standing right now is what's perceived to be by the international community a settlement. Like. When, when you hear those words, when you have people online telling you, I'm sure you get it because you do a lot of work online, is like, like, you're the one who's actually living side by side with these people. You're the one who's having these interactions with people. Like, if, if, if there's a message for people internationally that, that are not Jewish, that are not Muslim, that are not Palestinian or Israeli that are watching this video, like, I'd be curious to hear what you'd have to say to them. Well, I think that as Israeli society continues to develop, right, meaning and the forces within Israeli society that are more connected to our true identity become stronger, um, largely through birth rates, by the way, just because we've had more kids, and the forces within Israeli society that just want Israel to exist as some kind of uh, outpost of Western civilization become weaker, um, I think the opportunities for different kinds of relationships will begin to manifest. Uh, of course, they're also dangerous, meaning I think that as like what we can say the stronger Jews, right, like the Jews more connected to our identity, more willing to fight, kill and die for what we believe to be important to our people, become stronger in Israeli society, there's also a danger that we'll just, you know, take out the Palestinians, right, or like try to defeat them decisively. Uh, I think that uh, it's important to do whatever we can to build relations between specifically Jews like me, Jews who live in communities like mine, and our Palestinian neighbors before we reach that tipping point. Before we get, and, and that's without even factoring in the rapid growth of the Haredi population in this country that is... That, that might develop into something else as they become a dominant force within Israeli society. So w what's important to understand about this country, Israeli and Palestinian societies, is that they're very dynamic societies, uh, especially Israel. Um, that it's, you know, what, what Israeli society is today is not going to be Israeli society tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Like there's just like rapid changes taking place and a lot of, you know, cultural conflicts beneath the surface that need to be understood in order to really understand uh, our conflict with the Palestinians and where things can go, what possibilities exist for a better future for both of us here. Do you see a path to f for peace? Like, yeah, do you for see sure. a way? Yes, yes. Yeah? Yeah, but it requires us to be... Look, I, I think, first of all, because the power dynamics favor us, Israel, we need to be the ones to make the first move towards building trust. Uh, I think we don't trust each other right now. We're both essentially playing the role of antagonist in the other story, and we both have this like principled resistance to understanding the other as the other exists in his own story. So we're not even fighting each other. We're fighting our fantasies of one another. Right? And... Uh, so I think in order to overcome that principled resistance to understanding the story of the other, we first need to build trust. I think Israel needs to be the first one to make those moves because we have the power right now. Um, and I think that the more Jews who are really living our true story and are really connected to our real identity uh, and have like a clear understanding of what our people's story is about, what our history is about, uh, where we hope to go with this state of Israel that came into being in 1948, those Jews need to be the ones to drive our relationships with the Palestinians 
uh, and not those who live in North Tel Aviv and just want to be a satellite of the West, <laughs> right? I, I think it's a, a very you know very different possibilities exist when you um, when you put different uh, camps together, and etc. Um, but the future to you is not bleak. It's not hopeless. It's no, the not... future is not hopeless at all. I, th- I think that, uh, but again, it takes work. But first, we need to get past the greatest obstacle, which is the two-state paradigm. Mm-hmm. As long as people are thinking in terms of separating our peoples into two separate nation states, it's very hard for us to come together. I think uh, as soon as we understand two states is not the future, we're not going to partition this land, this land is going to remain whole, then we start to have real conversations about how to bring people together in a way that's healthy, in a way that's productive, in a way that's good for both peoples. It doesn't mean we're going to melt into one shared civic and national identity. I think we're each going to maintain our like independent kind of tribal identities, but we can be strong allies in building this country together. So... You that you actually do a lot of work on mm. the ground, not only with Israelis and Palestinians, but empowering Jews like me who mm. don't really... I mean, I would say I have a good sense of my identity, but the way that I speak to it around the world and tell people my identity, it probably doesn't line up exactly with what you preach, and I really like what you preach. Mm. So where can people find you if they're more interested in like work that you do? Uh, well, you can find me online. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm kind of on Twitter. I barely use it, <laughs> but I also am one of the leaders of the Vision Movement. That's visionmovement.org, and we also have an English-language online magazine, visionmag.org, and you can subscribe to the magazine or become a member of the movement. And... Of course, uh, I encourage your viewers to, uh, and you, to uh, check out our educational programs. We have a lot of online courses that I think you can benefit from, especially when it comes to Jewish identity, um, really applying post-colonial tools to our identity and our history, um, understanding the Palestinian perspective from Palestinian voices and learning how to tell our story better to the outside world because the truth is the story of the Jewish people is a very difficult story for anyone who's not a Jew to understand. Um, We're unique in history. There are very few examples, I can't think of any besides us, of an ancient people that was destroyed yet managed to come back to life 2,000 years later in the homeland it had been displaced from. Um, That's one of the reasons why one could look at the Zionist movement as an indigenous people's liberation movement or as a colonial project from Europe because both are technically true because we're unique in history and our story is therefore very difficult to tell. So if anyone is interested in learning how to tell our story better, um, if there are Jews interested in understanding the Palestinian story from their perspective, uh, or if there are people interested in applying post-colonial theory to Jewish identity, I encourage you to take our Atid online leadership program, which you can find at visionmovement.org. All right, so I'm uh, making my way out of Bet El right now, out of the community. I'm gonna be heading back to Jerusalem on a bus. And again, you know, like this is uh, its one of those videos where the concept's a lot deeper than me eating the best yada yada food in whatever country or showing you guys a really uh, cool travel location. These are deep political societal uh, concepts that you need to think about. And hanging out with somebody like Yuda and getting an explanation from him and his family about their lifestyle and the reasons that they're here, it adds so much more context into my life to deal with. It helps me rationalize and deal with the things that I've dealt with my entire life and then my family's history with trauma. Um, Again, for context's sake, I'm standing here in a Jewish settlement, quote-unquote, and over there is a Palestinian village, like an enclave of Ramallah, one of the biggest cities um, and most important cities to Palestinians. And it's, uh, it's just overall, it's very fascinating. It inspires me a lot to be able to sit down and have conversations with people like him, and know that at the end of the day, the intentions, uh, deep down, I can tell, are are genuine, you know? The way of finding a confident Jewish people and finding a confident Jewish nation here, in this land, the way to get there will not be easy. And this is what I drew from the conversation. It's not going to be easy, and uh, and there's a lot of... A lot of obstacles in the way, especially with finding peace with Palestinians, with our neighbors, which I've come to understand is so important and so valid. And their desires for nationhood and independence is so valid and so important as well for our happiness. Making all that work is going to be difficult, but 
but it's so worth it when I stand in a place like this and I'm able to look out and see our country, see our nation. And when I say our country, I mean for Israelis and Palestinians together. When I look at places like this and I see the potential to build something great here together, it's really, 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 really inspiring. And overall, it just makes me happy to think that there's people out there like him who are trying to help us and them. Help us and what is perceived, what I've perceived to be the enemy my whole life. And I'm sure that that's the same way that a lot of people on the other side feel. And I'm just talking off the cuff right now. No, this is scripted. This is just raw emotions from, from being in a place like this. It's powerful. It really is. And uh, I mean, the biggest thing that I could recommend especially for people who are watching this, who are not involved in this conflict, who have no stake in the game, is quietly observe, ask questions, but never assume, never dictate, never come out and start stating things with confidence. Come here, come see this place with your own eyes, understand the situations that people are living in. That's the biggest reason why I'm creating this series in the first place, is to come here and document this stuff, to show people what it's actually like here on the ground, to understand this stuff. That's the reason I'm making it. And I'm hoping that this just adds a little bit more context for you guys to see the other side of a quote unquote Israeli settlement in the West Bank. Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. I forgot to record an outro, but I wanna let you guys know that you could really help my channel by becoming a member and joining the channel. It'll go a long way at supporting the content. I'm working really, really hard on trying to make this series as great as it can be. And I see you guys are really enjoying it. So if you can spare it, I would much appreciate it. We'll see you in the next one. I love you long time. Goodbye, clats.